Hey folks, in recent episodes, I have been looking at a variety of approaches to visualizing global temperature change. We've been looking at global anomalies in temperature, which is a deviation from a normalized temperature between the years 1951 and 1980. We've been looking at this um, at an annual level, at a monthly level, and in today's episode, we're going to look at it at another level, which is at a two degree by two degree longitude latitude level. This will give us a greater sense of the variation in temperature anomalies across the Earth over the past 70 or so years. To do that, I have been inspired by this visual, this animation that comes to us from the Scientific Visualization Studio at NASA. And so this animation, I think, is really cool because it starts out in 1951, and you can see how this histogram or density plot moves over the past, I don't know, 70 or so years. Um, you can see, again, you know, leading up to about, you know, the mid-1980s, uh, it, it's right around zero. But then certainly as we march forward towards the present, uh, the deviation gets uh, quite considerably moved away from uh, the mean of zero that we saw before. Another approach that they took was a static version of that figure, where they basically made a ridgeline plot. And so a ridgeline plot has also been called a joy plot. Um, and I have always been looking for an application of a ridgeline plot. And here is um, our candidate. So basically, each of these density plots uh, represents a different decade from 1951 to the present. And so here they have, I think, seven different density plots. And what I was thinking was, it'd be really cool to make this go by year, so that we could have effectively 72 or so different ridgeline plots and see how that changes over time. In this version that NASA generated, they have coded it um, a gradient across the density. I'm not such a fan of that. I think what I'd rather do is color the fill of each density by the average temperature anomaly across all of the gridded points on the globe. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make this, but make it for all years rather than by the decade, and I'm gonna color it by the average temperature anomaly for that year. To get the data, I'm gonna to come to nasagiss.gov forward slash GIS temp here. And if we scroll down, we will see that they've got all sorts of data made available to us. The data I'm interested in is within this gridded monthly temperature anomaly data. Uh, we're gonna be looking at compressed net CDF files. And so these are on a two degree by two degree grid. Um, and we're looking at surface air temperature without ocean data. Um, and again, this is on that two degree longitude, two degree latitude data. When I put my finger <laughs> over that link, I see that it comes up as a GZ compressed file. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy the link address. Coming into our studio, I'll set up a new R script and I'm gonna paste that link into my R script. I'll go ahead and put this in quotes and then call that URL. And so that'll be the URL that we're downloading the gzipped uh, data from. And so as always, I'll start with library tidyverse, get that all loaded so we have access to those great tools. I then want to download the URL. So if I then do download dot file, I can then give it URL. I need to give it a destination file. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab that dest file. This downloads the file. It's about 10.6 megabytes, which is much larger than what I want to mess with. So I'm gonna go into my git ignore file and make sure that I've added uh, that file. So I'm gonna basically uh, put in here GIS temp star, so that'll match anything that starts GIS temp. The reason I'm doing this is because I don't wanna accidentally commit and then push a large file up to GitHub. So the next time I commit, that will um, be seen and it won't try to commit my GIS temp files. I'll end up removing the file anyway, so putting it in my git ignore is really just a safety measure. Now what I want to do is go ahead and decompress that gz file. So if you see gz, that's short for being gzipped. There is a tool called gunzip that we can use within R. It's also a Linux command line tool that we can get from the r.utils package. So library r.utils. Uh, if you don't have that installed already, you'll have to definitely install that package. Again, we can then do gunzip on uh, that file. So let me go ahead and grab all that with the quotes. I now look over in my files and I see that I now have a file that ends in .nc. Again, that's 52.8 megs. So that's quite large. I certainly don't wanna be pushing that up to GitHub, but thankfully again, we have 
kind of the stub of that file name in my .ignore file, so I don't have to worry about that. So as we saw in the browser, this is a net CDF file. And so I'm not sure how to work with that file because I'm not familiar with this data. Um, if you're familiar with GIS data analysis, looking at global information systems. So if I come to Google and do net CDF file R, I see the first link is how to open and work with net CDF files in R. So I'll go ahead and open that. And this opens up a demo that Allison Boyer from Oak Ridge National Labs developed of working with net CDF data. And so of course their data is gonna be different from my data, but what I'm gonna do is use their tutorial, their demo to figure out how to work with my own. And so the first thing I see is that we need the package net CDF4. Um, I've already installed that. I'd encourage you to do it as well. And so we'll go ahead and load that library Again, if you don't have it installed already, you will need to do that. As we come down, I'm gonna look at the commands that she ran and kind of copy it over into my R script. Um, again, I'm gonna have to change the names of some things, but I'm gonna grab this block where she uses nc open to open the file. She also has uh, these commands I see. Uh, so maybe I'll go ahead and plop these in and then let's look and see what actually happens. Um, and so the file I want is this, but without the GZ, right? So it's the gist temp 250 and so forth, ending in NC. And so I run that. And now if I look at NC data, I see all this great metadata that comes to the screen, right? And so there's two variables, excluding the dimension variables. There's time bounds. Uh, there's a temp anomaly with longitude, latitude, and time. It's showing the surface temperature anomaly data, um, and it's got all sorts of other information. There's then dimension data in here, the longitude, the latitude, the time, um, telling me something about the time that this is the days since 1800, uh, January 1st of 1800, right? So good. So looking back at this, we can print the NC data to a text file. So I'm going to go ahead and do that with this GIST temp file, uh, substituting in the name that they used for their text file. Um, I wasn't familiar with the sync approach, but basically you can create a output file using sync. You can then print the data and then you can sync to close it. So uh, they've put that in these curly braces. So if we run that, we now see that we get this gist temp text file that again is the same output that we had previously. So with the longitude and latitude, we can, we can run that, and if we look at lawn, going from negative 179 to 179 by two degree increments, that's cool. And then lat is going to be, I think, the same idea. Uh, again, going from negative 89 to positive 89. Then if we look at t, we see then that these are, again, all the days, the number of days since 1800. Cool. And we've already done this head on launch. So let's go back and see what else they had here. That's the data from their NDVI variable. I think that's gonna be the same as our temp anomaly variable. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab that. So again, I'm gonna replace NDVI with temp anomaly. And again, if I look at my text file, uh, that is this thing, right? That's the an analog of their NDVI, so temp anomaly. All right, so we run that, and then we do dim on that. And so we see there's three dimensions, right? Um, and so what we've got is the longitude, latitude, and time. So there's 1,709 months worth of data. Uh, these data are being spat out every month, I believe. Uh, we'll confirm that later on. But actually, if I look at these times, right, I see that this varies by 31 days. So yeah, I, I'm noticing about, you know, um, about a month's worth of jumping uh, between all the different time points. Now, looking down here, uh, looking at the fill values, this is what they use to fill in the missing data. So again, I'll copy this. And yeah, so we've got, uh, again, temp anomaly instead of NDVI. And so then if I look at fill value, I see that it has the attribute and that the value is 32767. And we can go ahead and remove that. As we see down here, we can make sure that gets set to NA uh, by um, using a little bit of base R magic, uh, which I'll plop in here and Again, this is not going to be my, well, I called it NDVI. Maybe I'll call it instead uh, T anomaly. I'll copy that here and there, and that should be all good. So let me just make sure this is all updated. So we now have this 
three-dimensional array that I would like to get to be a tidy format, right? And so one of the ways that we can easily do that is with the data table package. And so what we can do is we can come up again and add another package. So I'll do library data.table. Again, uh, you'll have to install this if you don't have it already. Um, what we could then do is we can then do as.data.table on uh, t anomaly array. And what I get out is a very long data frame with something like 8.86 million rows. Uh, one of the things about as.datatable is that it automatically removes the NA values. So it's already cleaned it up for us a bit, and it's taken that three-dimensional array and it's flattened it, right? So we've got, I think the rows are in V1, the columns are in V2, and that third dimension, time for us, is in V3, and then we see these values. So now what we need to do is go ahead and change V1, V2, V3 to our latitude, longitude, and time, as well as then make our value to be T data or T diff, right? So I'm going to start by converting this to a tibble. So we'll do as tibble. So we see we've got the tibble format. That's not that big of a change. I'll go ahead and do a select to change the names. So I'll make longitude equals V1, latitude equals V2, uh, time equals V3, and then T diff equals value. So again, these values of longitude, latitude, and time are the index value into the long Latin T vectors that I made up above here. And so I can then get those to be the proper degrees longitude, degrees latitude, and uh, date by using a mutate function, where we can then do longitude equals lon on longitude. Again, that lon square bracket means take the lon vector that we defined up above and take the value from the longitude column and plug that into the vector which will then return a value from the lawn vector. We can then do the same thing with latitude equals lat on latitude, right? And then we can then do time equals t on time. And then we can, yeah, let's run that and see what we get. Great, so then we have our degrees longitude, our degree latitude, and time. Again, that's the number of days since January 1st of 1800. So what we could do is we can take this time value, the number of days, and add it to the date 1800 January 1st, right? So we can do as dot date on 1800 hyphen 01 hyphen 01. And so that as date will convert our string, which is again, the ISO standard date notation, and we'll add the number of days, and we'll return a date for that column. So now we see that um, the first time point that we have data from this longitude latitude was uh, January 15th, 1957. I can go ahead and do a tail on this to see the most recent time points, which again, uh, this goes to May 15th. So I'm recording this on June 29th. Uh, and so I guess they don't quite have the June 15th data inserted into here yet. So again, we have longitude, latitude by month. Um, we also know uh, the year. Great. So I think we're in pretty good shape now to take this and to go ahead and summarize the data um, by year. And so to do that, I am going to go ahead and create another variable that I'll call year, and that will then be the year function on time, right? And so what I need to do is add another package that I'll call library lubridate. Uh, lubridate is installed with the tidyverse, so it should already be installed if you've got the tidyverse installed. We'll run all this, and so now we see that we have the year for each longitude and latitude. So I'm gonna go ahead now and group our data by the year, um, but we're also gonna group it by our longitude and our latitude. We'll then calculate the average across the 12 months for each longitude and latitude by doing summarize. I'm gonna call it T diff again um, as the mean of T diff, and I'm gonna to add to this dot groups equals drop. And so that will remove the grouping by year, longitude, and latitude. I now have the summary table by year, uh, lo year, longitude, latitude, T diff. Something I might do is go ahead and then count uh, the year to see how many temperatures I have or how many grid points I have for each year. Uh, and maybe I'll go ahead then and pipe this to ggplot AES with year on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, I'll put N. And then we'll go ahead and add uh, geom line 
to see what this all looks like, to see the frequency of sampling we have by year. So looking at this plot, we see that sampling really increased over time, but there was a step function, if you will, right around, you know, so this, this minor grid line is 1940, 1950 is right about there. Um, and so that's probably why they pick 1951 going forward. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace those lines with a filter to get the year greater than or equal to 1950. I'm gonna assign this to a variable T data. And so we'll have T data that we can then use to make our uh, ridge line plot. And as always, if we look at T data, we can then see the outputted tibble. Again, we're going to be looking by year at the distribution of T diff. So I'm gonna go ahead and take T data and pipe that to a filter. I just wanna look at a few years worth of data. And so I'll do filter uh, year uh, in, uh, and let's do uh, 2018, 2019, 2020, just three random years. And then we'll do ggplot AES. On the X axis, I wanna put um, the T diff. And then um, I'm gonna wanna get a fill color, but we'll hold on to that for now. And then let's do geome density. Ah, and I need to group it by year, right? So let's go ahead and do group equals year. Uh, and for now, let's also do fill equals year. And so we can kind of see that there's three different shades of blue in here. If I were to set the alpha uh, to say like 0.3, um, you could kind of see that there's three different uh, shades of blue in there. What we want to use is a ridge line plot, and that's going to come to us from the GG ridges package. So again, we'll come back up here and do library uh, GG ridges. And again, if you don't have GG ridges installed, you'll definitely need to do that first. So I'm going to go ahead and replace this geom density with geom density um, ridges. So it's complaining uh, that geom density ridges requires the following missing aesthetic, Y. And so Y is basically the position um, kind of up or back into the screen where I wanna draw each of the different distributions. If I look at this static image, again, the Y would be these different decades. And so for me, that's going to be the year. So this group needs to be a Y. Also, year is a continuous variable and um, geome density ridges is gonna want this to be a factor. It's gonna want it to be a categorical variable. So I can do factor on year. And so now you can see um, that we have uh, the three different distributions uh, back on top of each other. Maybe I'll use some different years. So let's go ahead and do 1950, 1980, uh, let's do 2000, and then 2020. And so you can kind of see from 1950 going forward um, the shift in the distribution. These distributions are pretty bumpy, whereas again, the original were fairly smooth. It's telling us that it's picking a bandwidth of 0.1. And so actually, if I go in here and I do bandwidth equals, let's do 0.2, we'll get a smoother distribution. Uh, maybe if we take that up to like 0.3, that looks a bit better. Uh, again, the distributions on that original plot were fairly smooth. Again, I want my fill color to be set by the average temperature um, across all of the years. So back up in the pipeline where I made T data, I'm gonna do another group by a year. And we're then going to do a mutate on T av, and that's gonna be the mean of T diff. And so again, if I look at T data, I now get this extra column that has the T av. And so then instead of fill equaling year, I can do T av. And so now I see uh, that I've got this dark blue color uh, for a mean of zero basically at 1950 and a lighter blue color uh, for 2020. So this is reminding me that we don't have all the data yet for 2022. So I also wanna add an and here to my filter to do year less than 2022 because we don't have a full year's worth of data yet. So let's go ahead then and add in scale uh, fill gradient uh, two. We've seen this before. But for our low, we'll do uh, dark blue. Our mid uh, will be the default of white. And then our high will be dark red. And our midpoint, uh, again, it's the default, but just want to be explicit, we'll set at zero. And so we can then see that, you know, again, where the average for the year was zero, we get a pretty white color. Um, and then it kind of increases in intensity as that mean distribution moves off to the right. Let's go ahead and remove the filter where we're only looking at those four years. 
so we can see the full ridgeline plot. Uh, it's starting to shape up to look like we want it to, so I'm happy with that. Um, I would like to flip the order. I want 1950 at the top and 2021 at the bottom. To do that down here, um, where I define the factor, I can then do levels equals uh, seek, uh, again, going from 2021 to 1950 by negative one. Um, and I'm gonna put these on separate lines because they're kind of long and they're scrolling off the side of the screen, but that should get us to flip the order of our years. Sure enough, we now have 1950 at the top and 2021 at the bottom, and we can see the shift in that distribution over to the right. The next thing I wanna turn my attention to is the um, x-axis scale. On the original plot, it goes from basically negative five to positive five, but we have labels of negative four to four. So again, here we can then do, um, I'm gonna start with chord Cartesian and we'll do x lim uh, from uh, negative five to five. Um, chord Cartesian will zoom in, whereas if I did scale x continuous, it would remove the data from outside but I wanna include all that data so I get the full shape of the data. So again, that zooms in and makes it easier to see the distribution that we want to see. Um, to get the breaks that I want on the x-axis, I'll do scale x continuous, and then we'll do breaks uh, of seek from negative four to four by two. That's great. I'd also like to make my years go every 10 years. And so then we'll do scale uh, y, and it, we're gonna use actually discrete because again, we turn the year into a factor. And so then here we'll do discrete and we'll then do breaks of, um, go from seek of 1950 to 2020 by 10 year increments. And so there again, we see 1950 at the top and 2020 at the bottom. So the peaks on my ridgeline plot seem a bit muted to me. And so an argument that I can add to geom density ridges is scale. And so if I do scale equals one, the top touches the bottom of the next. So if I up this to say two, we have more overlap. And then three is even more overlap. It makes the peaks look a bit taller. I kind of like the, this appearance um, because it gives you a more sense of the, the kind of peaks to the distributions. And, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with the, the way that looks. So I'm gonna leave that there. Now I wanna turn my attention to doing more of the styling of the figure. Uh, to make it look more attractive. I'd like to go with that black background um, to kind of make the colors really pop out. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and remove the legend. So here in scale fill gradient two, I can do guide equals none. Again, that gives us more real estate to work with. I'm gonna go ahead also and turn off uh, the Y lab. So I'll do labs Y equals null. The original had temperature anomaly in degrees C. So on X, I'll do temperature anomaly uh, and again the unicode because i've typed this so many times now u 0 b 0 c um, we'll get the the degree sign with celsius and then title uh, let's go ahead and put what they've got so land temperature anomaly distribution and so it's coming together and so before i do much more tweaking of the sizes and po positions of things i want to go ahead and save this uh, with gg save so i'll go ahead and do gg save uh, figures temp distribution dot png and it's really tall and really narrow so i'm going to make my height uh, let's do six width equals three so maybe we can make it a little bit wider so let's go ahead and do width equals four again that looks pretty nice i now want to flip <laughs> the color uh, to make white black and black white we'll go ahead and do that with the theme function um, and so I'm gonna do text equals element, text color equals white. Uh, and again, that'll take all of the text elements and make them white. Then I'll do panel.background uh, equals element rect, fill equals black. I'll also do plot.background equals element rect, fill equals black. And I also wanna remove the grid lines from the panel. So I'll do panel.grid element blank. For whatever reason, it didn't turn all my text white like I expected it to, um, but we've got the black background. Um, so let's go ahead back to those labels on the X and Y axis. So I'll go ahead and do axis dot text equals element text uh, color equals white. 
And then we also have the axis dot ticks uh, that were gray and not white. We'll do element uh, line color equals white on that as well. So looking at the original, one thing they have here that I like is that they have a line for the X axis. Again, if we come back into our theme, we can do axis dot line dot X equals element line uh, color equals white. Um, I'm pretty sure we don't have a line for the Y axis, but just in case we can do axis dot line dot Y equals element blank. Um, and that will get rid of that as well. So one other thing that I notice about this is that we have this kind of thick black line for each of the distributions. And what I'd like to do is maybe turn that into a thinner white line to make it easier to kind of see the differences between uh, the different curves. So I definitely want to make it thin. I'm not totally sure if I want it to be black or white. So again, if we come back up here to geom density ridges, we can change that with uh, say size equals 0.2 and then let's do color equals white. So the thing I like about the color equals white, um, besides not being super overwhelming within the plot, is that it gives the effect of a grid line all the way across for each year, right? Um, and so that's kind of nice. I guess if we turned it black and made it really thin, then we wouldn't see that. Um, we could also then get rid of uh, the, the color as well. Um, but I kind of like having either white or black to get some definition between these different ridges. And, and I kind of like this look. I don't know what you think, but let me know perhaps down below in the notes. Maybe what I'll do is get rid of the tick marks on the Y axis. Um, but I, I like the way this looks. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that tick. So we'll go ahead and do axis.ticks.y equals element blank. So I'm pretty happy with the way this came out. Um, I like having a histogram for each year. Um, I think you see a lot of interesting things going on and questions that just kind of pop to mind, like, you know, why do we have kind of bimodal distributions in some years? Um, you know, are these the same locations on the globe uh, that have lower temperatures than the rest of the, the, the globe, right? Um, and so uh, that's, the, I think, the mark of a great visual is that it tells a story and then forces you to think of additional questions that you can then dig back into the data uh, to answer those questions. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and save this R script into my code directory. Um, and I'll call this temp distribution ridgeline. Finally, before we quit, we want to go ahead and close our connection. So we'll do NC close on our NC data. And then we also want to unlink or remove those files, those just temp files that we told git ignore to ignore. So to do that, we'll do unlink um, and we'll then do just temp uh, that NC file and then unlink uh, the git temp uh, text file, right? So we'll go ahead and run all those. And then we see that those files are no longer in our files directory and we are good to go. I'll get this committed and pushed up to GitHub so that you can download it along with all the data so you can see exactly what I did. I strongly encourage you to work with this code, manipulate some of the values, see if you can get a different appearance to the plot, perhaps something that is more suiting your sensibilities. Let me know what you come up with, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.